first thing I want to do is give thanks and ask for a blessing. And, um, so Heavenly Father, you uh, thank you for safely bringing us all together here today. I pray for the ability to effectively communicate the wisdom that you have shared with me as you guided me like you guided Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. I pray that you grant the men and women here the maximum benefit from what I have to offer. And I really appreciate you all coming out. Thank you very much. So, uh, in Isaiah, 117 uh, says to uh, defend the fatherless and plead the cause of the widow. And in Matthew 25 uh, says to visit the prisoners. And uh, it also says to set the captives free. And uh, I try and do a bunch of that. And uh, I know that some are here because they have uh, family or friends behind bars. And uh, as, uh, as our good friend Ron here, who's uh, helped with, you know, he's put this whole thing together, uh, made, made this uh, room look the way it looks. Ron, Ron has had his experience and knows that, in his own words, more than 75% of the people behind bars don't belong there. And uh, I mean, that's just the way it is. They, you know, the shysters put a lot of innocent people behind bars. And uh, they have a system that makes it profitable for them. But it's certainly hell and misery for everyone else. So, uh, <clears throat> um, let's see here. I have a disclaimer, and that is first, I am not licensed to practice law. <laughs> Thus, I cannot and will not provide legal advice. I merely recount the uh, various facts, presumptions, hypothesis and personal experiences that, uh, that have led me to certain uh, conclusions, theories, uh, uh, conclusions and theories as to how the legal system generally functions. Second, no legal theory or strategy works all the time. The best lawyers in the world routinely lose cases based on legal strategies and theories that the judge or jury deems unconvincing. Thus, the only thing you can expect from any uh, legal theory or strategy is that it may increase the probability that you may win in court. Third, you must recognize that to be free, one must also be independent and personally responsible. Thus, if you hear a theory or a strategy at the seminar, whether from me or just from other people in the, in the gathering here, uh, and that uh, theory seems valuable to you, you must independently confirm the value of that information and its applicability in your own case, because we all have to take personal responsibility. Um, and it's easy to make mistakes in, the, in this, in the, you know, they have case law, and all that, and uh, and then the Supreme Court reverses their own decisions <laughs> and things like that. It's kind of nebulous um, in some in some sort of circumstances. And fourth, I present this seminar within the boundaries of Arizona, a state of the union, to living men and women. I make this presentation without prejudice to my God-given unalienable rights and at arm's length. Uh, next thing is that uh, I need to ask, are there any 
government agents present here. Well, uh, no one is admitted to being a government agent, so they can't use uh, anything that's gathered here as evidence against uh, you or me. Um, I'll explain right now that I'm, I'm not a genius and I cannot answer every question, although given some time and drawing upon my own experience along with a little help from friends, uh, I've been able to help quite a few people, uh, or I should say uh, quite a few men and women deal with this oppressive system. And uh, I was in California doing a seminar, and uh, the break came, and uh, a fellow came up, and this is why I'm going to address this right now. He came up, and he said, in a very stern tone of voice, he said, you get people out of prison? And uh, I could tell what he was thinking. He was thinking, I get murderers, rapists, and robbers off so that they can do it all over again. Well, that's, that's not what I'm about. And I explained it to him like this. My interest is in helping the innocent, and I'll even help the repentant. I certainly am not going to get involved with anyone who is going to continue to do evil. Okay? Now, in the category of those who would continue to do evil, there are some serious and real good con men. And uh, an example that comes to mind is my friend Braden has a good friend, Fred, and Fred has a son. And uh, Fred's son was indicted for uh, having a meth lab on his property. Well, it was a detached garage and the claim was that he didn't know anything about the, what was going on in the rent, in, in, in another guy rented the detached garage for wow. furniture making. And uh, anyway, um, Brady asked me for my help because it was his good friend, Fred, it was Fred's son, and, uh, and it was presented to me that this was all, uh, you know, that this guy was innocent. Well, uh, turns out that, uh, and the point I'm getting to is, is this, I cannot overcome the hand of the Almighty. And it goes like this, I put in some of my best work helping Brady and the uh, this was for the fellow's uh, uh, allocution, and uh, we had an allocution script ready for him, and that guy could not speak. Our, our Heavenly Father, you know, he came in, and he was just like head on low, and all of the excuses had disappeared, and he literally couldn't speak. He couldn't take the paper, and and even just read what it was on the paper. And so he went to prison, and it turned out that that's where he belonged. And, uh, and who knows, you know, I mean, we don't know what our Heavenly Father's uh, purposes are. Uh, that guy was caught, and he went to prison, and it may be that it saves his life, because maybe he was involved in a drug that would have killed him in a year or two. But um, anyway, um, I think, uh, I hope you understand where I'm coming from on that, on that point. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, Ron, do you think, you think it's ringing a little bit too much or not? No. It's okay? I think you're asking the air conditioner. Okay. So, um, I'd like to ask, a couple questions uh, so I know the level of where people are at in this class. Um, I know that there's 
probably some people here that are flat out experts and may even know more than me. Hopefully they still get a point or two uh, from, from this, uh, um, from this uh, opportunity here. Um, I know that from attending a lot of seminars myself that sometimes you pick up not only what the speaker has to say, but mingling with others, you pick up the points as well. And hopefully, whatever your problem is, uh, success is within your grasp. Um, so, are there are there people here that consider themselves complete novices? Okay. All right. Well, we will cover it, and I hope everyone else has the patience for it. That, you know, we'll try and really quickly cover certain points on that. Like, as, as for instance, um, I will speak about affidavits, and I can't tell you how many times I've run into it where somebody does up a document and they put at the top of it affidavit, and it's not an affidavit because an affidavit has to have certain elements. And if they're not there, it's not an affidavit, even though they labeled it one. So we'll, we'll cover some of that stuff. And uh, with regards to affidavits, habeas corpus, uh, amicus curiae, and all that kind of stuff, and, um, and what, it, what it means, you know, the style of the case, et cetera, we'll cover that. Um, so for the benefit of the the new people so that they can hopefully leave here uh, at the end of this weekend with a foundation from which they can move forward with power and authority. So, um, you know that. And, um, to also share that uh, the good news is that whether you're a novice or you know in the middle or wherever you are in your status in, in learning this law stuff um, you can win even if you're at the lowest level and you can win you can win on the law you can win on the facts you can win on the procedure you can win on the counsel issue alone you can win by sheer fluke, or you can win by prayer power, and maybe there's other things that I haven't even mentioned. But you can win, and it's just a matter of, of uh, educating yourself to the best of your ability for one thing to start with. It's like, uh, my, my concept of it is, I have to work as hard as I can, um, as if everything depends on me, and pray is, as if everything depends on our Heavenly Father. And of course, in the ultimate final analysis, I believe it does depend on our Heavenly Father. What I intend to do in this weekend is to share some powerful tools with you folks. And, uh, um, well, actually, we'll start off with my background. So, has some information in it and you'll have a better understanding where I'm coming from and you'll also get some of that information as we cover that issue of my background and then we'll go into the powerful tools that you can use to uh, overcome various um, situations in, in the legal environment. Um, and when we can cover those, those tools, uh, I'd like to do it with examples from my experience or maybe from other people's experiences. Um, we'll cover affidavits, the counsel issue, amicus curiae, habeas corpus, offer of proof, show cause, uh, and uh, a particular thing that they like to do to us all the time is they will state a rule, and that rule could crush you in a court case, okay? But 
to come back on the rules is 28 U.S.C. 2072 B. B. B, like in Bumblebee. Would you repeat that? Sure. 28 U.S.C. 2072 B. Like bum. Huh? Like bum. Yeah. Like bum. <laughs> So, so anyway, um, 28 U.S.C. is law, and their rules are their rules, okay? But what 28 U.S.C. 2072B says, rules cannot abridge rights. So then you just have to put it, you have to frame your issue within your rights whether that's the right to free speech or, or actually what the most powerful of the whole works is your right to free exercise of religion. And uh, in that regard, it's like this. All children must going to school must be vaccinated. Oh, unless you're a Christian scientist, it's against their religion. <laughs> and, uh, Everyone has to take the Pledge of Allegiance uh, to the flag and all that, uh, unless you're a Jehovah Witness, they don't believe in it. Uh, everyone has to have their picture on your driver's license, unless they believe that the uh, picture is a graven image uh, and contrary to the First Commandment, or not the First Commandment, but the commandments. So. So anyway, um, um, it was in the First Amendment, uh, free exercise of religion. So uh, the, there, there are people who believe that the picture is a graven image, and I've seen the driver's license. And they have a square for the photograph, and inside this square it says, valid without photo. <laughs> No, I don't know how many, how many have seen that? One, one gentleman here is two? Okay, two have seen that. I've seen it as well. So, you know, they will try and convince you at the Department of Motor Vehicles that you have to have your picture taken. Well, if you believe that it's a graven image, it's out. So, um, and there's numerous other things, uh, like one example that comes to get to mind is uh, a young lady was in a car wreck, if I recall correctly, it was a car wreck. Anyway, she went to the hospital and they said that, uh, and they told the parents, when the parents called on the phone, they said uh, she needs some blood parents went ballistic. They said, no, it's against our religion. The hospital gave her the blood anyway. Okay? Now, they, if I recall correctly, these people were Jehovah Witness. And um, they don't believe in that. And the fact of the matter is that the blood in the blood bank is all dead stuff anyway. And it's, it's a virtually a hoax, uh, from what I understand because you can do without the blood, what you need is the fluid. And so if you have uh, the, uh, uh, with the electrolytes, an electrolyte solution, the body will quickly turn that to blood and it'll be real blood in your blood, not somebody else's. Well, the somebody else that had donated the blood for this young lady gave her hepatitis and uh, big problem. So, um, <clears throat> religious free exercise is a powerful right, and their rules can't stand up to that period. And I'll mention one other thing in, in these tools. Uh, people who play chess are an at an advantage. And what I mean by that is this. If you play chess, you have to think not just on the next move, but you have to think several moves ahead 
not just what you're doing, but what the other side is doing. Okay? So if that's just a, a, a lesson, and of course, if you play chess, it's ingrained in you. If you don't play chess, it's an important thing to keep in mind. It isn't just what you do, it's what they do in response to you, and then what you do in response to their response, and what they do in response to that, and it's back and forth like a tennis match. Hmm. Um, we have, uh, or I have some, some books, I hope to arrive here in time. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to Ron, but we've got some at, uh, that are probably at the book of your, your mailbox. Um, so if we get a chance, we need to get them. We've still got them today and tomorrow to get them in here. But um, um, anyway, one of the items that I wanted to show you is a little book that is like about this size and it fits in your shirt pocket. And when you open it up, it opens, naturally opens in the middle. And so you're looking at two pages and it's two columns of all the objections that you can do in the courtroom. And uh, the outer edges are tabbed. So if you're halfway familiar with these objections and you open this up and you move down the tabs to the objection that you need, and it flips automatically, you know, you got it with the tab, you're automatically there, and it's laid out for you perfectly because every word is right because it was created by a judge. And I think he created it mainly for attorneys as opposed to us. <laughs> but uh, this is a powerful tool to have because those attorneys that you're up against, they've had years of training and they've had years of experience. And for a lot of us, it's, you know, our first time or we've only had a little bit of experience. And by the way, while wow, that's fresh in my mind, if you are much better off handling it and, and tackling a traffic matter from beginning to end, and getting some experience before you ever run into something like federal tax evasion. Because if you get in a, in a traffic case, you can learn your lessons without the jeopardy. But when you go into a major federal felony, the jeopardy could be real serious. You know, it could be 20 years or something like that. And, and for Anyone who's like up at my age, that's a death sentence, you know? And that's the other part of it is that the worst thing about the prison environment is the fact that you cannot get proper or competent uh, medical care. I mean, they've been known to leave guys in the cell writhing on the floor, screaming in agony for days or even weeks and then they just die, and they don't care. At most, and not most, I mean, I, I, I a lot of facilities, they just don't care. And, and what they call it is malingering. Yeah. So, you know, anyone who has a, an actual health problem, they just say, well, he's faking it, and they go on, and they can't be bothered to do anything about checking or making sure. So, um, um, and I was going to show you all uh, a couple of books that uh, we'll have here tomorrow. Uh, and uh, one of them is the U.S. Government Manual. Another one is uh, O'Connor's. And Judge O'Connor was, uh, or is a judge uh, in, uh, in Texas. She was an appellate court judge, and um, she was tired, fed up with attorneys coming in with sloppy paperwork, missing certain essentials, so on and so forth. And so she created a set of books 
it was like paint by number. And, and so it just tells you, fill this in here, fill that in there, you know, and they, they could put in brackets and they say, name of defendant, name of plaintiff, name of uh, sheriff, and you know, county, city, whatever. And uh, all that stuff is, you know, made so that, uh, you know, a 10 year old could do it. And uh, it's just a beautiful set of books. Uh, of course, you don't have to buy the whole set uh, of everything. You just get what you need, uh, whether that's uh, federal or state or whatever. Um, and uh, what was I going to say about that? Uh, whatever you need, uh, they've got it. And even if you're uh, here in Arizona, uh, well, it's just a flash, I'm just thinking. It was a habeas corpus that I did. Uh, the mother had contacted me, and the family lived, lived in Vermont. And the daughter, Nicole, was in jail in New Hampshire. And at the time, I was cut off from my resources. And so I wrote up to habeas corpus using Texas law. <laughs> it arrived on the clerk's desk at 1.05 p.m. And by five o'clock, Nicole said she was being pushed out of the jail onto the street, and they wouldn't—they didn't want to let her finish eating her meal. <laughs> so you can use what you need to do. You know what I'm saying? And uh, and in that particular case, it's called equal footing doctrine. And. Um, So the laws, you can use them to your advantage, even in another state. Say, for instance, uh, you're in Florida, and they get you for having a concealed weapon. You got a nine millimeter on your suit jacket or something. And they, there it's against the law. So, but they're devastated when you say, well, I'm from Vermont, and we don't have any of that nonsense in Vermont, and so I'm carrying my gun. <laughs> oh, okay. That's just the way it is. So, um, and then, of course, there's court decisions, and it's called full face and credit in the Constitution. So you can have a court decision from Idaho and use it in Arizona under full face and credit. And, uh, um, mark something else down here before I forget to. <coughs> Let me just mark down this Rule 12 agency. Texas they have a Rule 12, uh, and it makes it real clear. Uh, you can challenge the authority of any attorney. And if that attorney cannot show his authority, all their pleadings are stricken from the record. Now, um, we'll cover that in more detail, but you can you can use that to win a case. I have done that. Um, you're, you're talking about his authority to be in the case? Yes. The attorney always shows up and says, I represent ABC Mortgage or whatever, right? And in the case I was in, it's, uh, the um, well, we're taking a little bit out of step, but well, it seemed like people perked up with that. <laughs> so I'll just address it right now real quick. Uh, a doctor friend of mine, when I was uh, crippled and, and blind, uh, you know, he made a, a house available to me. And uh, he had purchased the house for his daughter when she was going to college, when she'd gone. And, 
Mary had gone off to Houston. And uh, so he said, you know, when I said I, uh, I was uh, in need of a place, and he, he said, well, here, here's the keys and the place and just down the road here. So um, uh, after I moved in, we had a big surprise within a matter of days. My doctor friend was going through a, a bitter divorce, and uh, his ex-wife was trying to make a problem, so she was making a problem. The first time he fell behind, oh, let me say this, this is a guy, this doctor friend of mine, he had six clinics, and he had uh, so much going on, he would be at one clinic six days a week at separate clinics to keep an eye on them, and, and he had a staff under him and so on and so forth. Basically, the only way a check got signed is if one of his secretarial staff came to him with a clipboard and a check for him to sign, you know. And, and he didn't pay attention to this other stuff. He was, I think, earning maybe 10 million a year at the time. And uh, so this piddly little house and the mortgage payment fell behind because they didn't send the notices properly. And what they did is they sent the notice. When, they, when he did get a notice that it was behind, no problem, he just paid it right up. The next time, they didn't send him the notice. They sent it to his ex-wife and she kept it quiet. They went into foreclosure. The house was sold on the, fork, on the courthouse steps. And next thing I get the papers that I'm supposed to move up. Well, I didn't move out. So what comes next is forcible detainer action. So forcible detainer action, we go to the, to the JP court, which is a low-level court. I challenge the authority of the attorney. The JP doesn't understand that. It's like, well, if he, re he says he represents the mortgage company, I guess he does. And uh, uh, so he didn't understand it, but, and he ruled against me. I just go to the counter and I said, I'm going to peel this up to the county. And uh, so at the county court, things proceed like starting over. And um, it's called de novo. So things are starting over. And the attorney's filing his papers. And then he's moving for summary judgment, which is coming at a date sometime coming up in the future. They have to give you at least 21 days on the summary judgment. So I filed the Texas Rule 12 agency it Texas Rule 12 challenge to the authority of the attorney. And I filed it and got it a court setting just literally a couple of days prior to the summary judgment. So I was ahead of him. And um, you know, I slipped there and I say, a challenge to the authority of the attorney, and I said the word agency. And the agency is the key. Now, there are a couple of sets of books that are like the Encyclopedia Britannica of Law. And one is Corpus Juris, and the other one is Amjur. And they're like, if I recall correctly, they're in their second, you know, revision now. But uh, whether it's first or second, uh, agency is not a topic covered in a, in a paragraph or, or one page or anything like that. It's like 400 pages. Agency is real serious. And to give you an idea how serious, uh, those who don't know, uh, Michael Minns, wrote a book called The, and he's an attorney. He wrote a book called The Underground Lawyer, and in it he describes the situation. So there's a, a fellow who's married, and he has a state and I guess wealth, and uh, he is going overseas to Europe, and uh, he gives power of attorney to his best friend. <coughs> And he leaves. 
Now, when he comes back, he comes to find that his best friend liquidated the estate and took all the cash for himself. Not only that, but his best friend divorced him from his wife. But I guess his best friend felt sorry for him because he married him to some other woman. <laughs> And, and, and not only that, helped him out by consummating the marriage. <laughs> so, so this guy is upset, and it ends up in court, and the judge says, well, did you give him power of attorney? Well, yes, he did. Did you put any restrictions on it? No, he didn't. So the judge says, well, he could do what you could do because of the power of attorney. You could have liquidated your estate and stuck all the cash in his pocket. You don't have to, he's already done it for you. <laughs> this, and you could divorce your wife, but you don't have to, he's done it for you. And you could uh, marry some other woman, uh, you know, you don't have to, he's done it for you. The only thing that was against the law was consummating the marriage for him because that would have been a contract in the nature of prostitution. <laughs> Everything else stood. <laughs> so, anyway, agency and authority and all that stuff is a very important topic. And going back to this uh, case, so we come in on my challenge, it's my, my challenge to the authority of the attorney, and the burden of proof is on him. And he's got a stack of papers, and he's showing the judge this and that, this and that, going on and on, doing all this talking and everything else. And finally he's finished, and the judge turns to me and says, well, Mr. Fox, what do you have to say about that? I said, well, I've already won. And you should see the look on the judge's face well, what do you mean you've already won? And uh, I said, well, agency cannot be proven out of the mouth of the agent. It must be proven out of the mouth of the principal. And there's nobody in this courtroom from, from Bankers Trust uh, of California to substantiate what this guy is saying. And the judge was like flabbergasted and he said, well, I've never presided over a Texas Rule 12 hearing before. I'm going to have to do some research. And I said, oh, research. I said, I have it all right here in this three-ring binder. I have all the appellate cases, everything highlighted. I said, you take a look at it, and I'll be expecting your ruling shortly. Ten days later, I had a certified win in my hand. Their lawsuit was in the trash barrel and shredded. <laughs> So, um, um, going along the lines of the, the plan that I had to share with you, where I'm coming from with this stuff, um, in, I was born and raised in Canada, and uh, in 1977, I was in a motor vehicle accident. And uh, tragically, two people died. Uh, there's no way I can bring it back. Uh, the, uh, I myself was taken to the hospital in an ambulance. And uh, from the hospital, uh, I was taken to the jail. And uh, then I was prosecuted uh, on the matter. And um, with my business, they had and this is all back in the day when I didn't know much you know, on the legal stuff. And they had a, uh, an attorney that handled some of the business stuff. And uh, he said to me, he said, you need to get, uh, he said, I do uh, civil stuff. And, and he said, you need to get yourself a good criminal attorney for this. And I did. So, um, and in fairness to the, the guy, he was, it was pretty good, actually. Uh, I could have easily had, you know, 
as somebody who would be a complete idiot. But um, uh, one of the things they did was check this court reporter as to who was who, was, who would be a good attorney. Because you can't go by the Yellow Pages ads or what these guys say on the phone. You know, so it was a court reporter that that said that this guy was good. Actually gave me a couple of names, but anyway. Um, so I get this one, it's good. Well, uh, went to trial, and the trial delved into every aspect of the accident. I was acquitted. Two, three days later, I was served with papers at my office, hauling me right back into the court system on exactly the same charge. And I went to the attorney and I said, this, you know, this is what they're doing there, hauling me back into the appeals court on the same charge as I've already been acquitted on. He went back in his chair and threw up his hand like, they can't do that. <laughs> and, and I said, well, it appears they have, you know. And uh, this was my uh, beginning of understanding, you know, uh, political persecution. Because uh, I had the misfortune of having this accident with the brother-in-law of the president of the Criminal Trial Lawyers Association, with all the connections. But not only that, he was the chairman of the Zionist organization as well. Criminal what? President uh, or chairman of the Zionist organization oh. in that in that province in Canada. We're in that area. And so they had, like, very powerful connections. So when you show up in the appeals court, there were five judges. One was reading a book, two were carrying on a conversation, one was looking out the window, and only one judge was paying attention to the case. The other four had already decided because they were linked with the family deceased. And the one judge who was paying attention to the case, wrote in his opinion, the case had no business being in the appeals court. And his decision enabled me, I had, that made it so that I had a right to go to the Supreme Court of Canada in Ottawa. And so I said to the attorney, I said, uh, I'm gonna go to Ottawa and watch my case at the Supreme Court. And he said, well, this is highly unusual. He said, okay. he said, you won't even be able to sit with me. He said, you'll have to sit with the visitors, you know, the, the, the tourists in, in the visitors gallery. And I said, well, if that's where I have to sit, that's where I'll sit. And, um, and then he said, this is utterly incredible. He said, anyone who appeals to the Supreme Court of Canada in a criminal case is in prison but I'd already been acquitted. <laughs> so it, it was that bizarre, and it was actually taught at the, uh, at the university law school that my case was brought about by political manipulation from behind the scenes from its inception. And it was an aberration in law, so you got things going on like this, then there's my case, and then things go back to normal, <laughs> you know, like that. And um, the Supreme Court heard the case. I was there. They decided not to decide at the time. And uh, I had to fly back from Ottawa, Ontario, to Winnipeg, Manitoba. And of all the planes and all the seats, who do I end up sitting beside? None other than the prosecutor himself. <laughs> And the first thing he says to me is, he said, uh, Robert, uh, as far as I'm concerned, personally, I feel you're getting a raw deal here, but it's just my job. And uh, so that's the way it was. And uh, I went back to, to Winnipeg, and uh, months went by. Uh, the overall picture, the part that I hadn't mentioned so far, is that this litigation spanned three years from 1977 to 1980. And during those three years, uh, there were numerous death threats. And 
uh, I knew that these people had the ability to carry that out because from the outside, somebody can secure a murder on the inside with as little as a carton of cigarettes. So um, I contemplated the situation. I talked with friends, and you know, I said, well, you know, what do you do? And uh, they said, well, you know, they said if it was them, they'd hit the road. And uh, you know, I thought about it, and I said, okay. So I uh, left Canada. And uh, in 1980, in January, and came uh, to Texas. And um, for 10 years, I was an illegal alien and a fugitive. As a matter of fact, to this day, there's still a candidate warrant for my arrest. Now, um, you might notice I'm not there, I'm here. <laughs> and, uh, and that will we'll be discussing about the power of affidavits. There's five affidavits sitting with immigration, and uh, that makes it uh, that makes it it puts it in this in a framework that. Well, let me say this: I've been attacked repeatedly by immigration, and and had an immigration agent, for instance, screaming at me and everything else, and, uh, and telling me no ands, ifs, buts, or maybes, I was being deported back to Canada. And uh, I'm still here. Now, one of those affidavits is, uh, was executed by the attorney, and he blocked a physical attack at the courthouse. He's a big guy. He was, at six foot four, and uh, he blocked a physical attack at the courthouse and did up his affidavit. And uh, so they know that my life is threatened in Canada, and when your life is threatened, they cannot send you back. Okay? So it's, it amounts to a situation where, you know, the Attorney General for the United States in Washington, D.C. could be pounding the desk with both fists and yelling his, at the top of his lungs that Fox has to be deported. And the answer is still no. And it's the law. And, and the interesting thing, like much of the other stuff, is that it comes from this book. Amen. Um, I, uh, some people here probably know of George Gordon. Yeah, okay. Well, when immigration first attacked me, uh, well, let me say this. Okay, I'm getting out of joint here. I should uh, uh, explain it. So uh, for 10 years, I was an illegal alien and a fugitive. Now, I did a process that I call act as if. What? Which act as if. It's a very powerful thing I, in my estimation. And act as if is, is like this. Uh, I act as if I belong here. And those around me accept that. Okay? And so I was standing in the barn area at Rio Doso, New Mexico, for instance. This is just one of many examples. And uh, I'm discussing something with a horse trainer there. And it happens that on that day, several truckloads of, of immigration agents arrive in the barn area. And I mean, the illegal aliens are in a mad dash and a scramble. I mean, they're literally being tackled like football players. You know? and, and the handcuffs are being put on them. Where I'm standing and talking to the horse trainer, illegal aliens are being handcuffed on both sides of me, only about six or eight feet away. And I don't let any of that enter into my space. I just carry on with my conversation with the horse trainer, like, like I belong there. And, you know, had I made a mad dash like the others, you know, it would have been a different situation. I think you can all appreciate that. If 
I needed directions in a, in a place. I might flag down a police car and ask for directions from a police officer. You know what I'm saying? If you act like you belong and if you act like you know what you're doing, then, you know, um, then it becomes, you know, it becomes real. If you, uh, if you act like what you know, that you know what you're doing in the courtroom, and it doesn't take a lot, just a few pointers and so on. By the way, I highly recommend that even if you don't have a case yourself, that you sit and watch trials or arraignments. You don't have arraignments, they'll have 50 people in for arraignments. You'll see that they process them like cattle. You'll, if you watch a trial, you get to see how the thing goes. You see what happens from beginning to end, and you become acclimated to the situation. Even if you have a case, when the case starts up, and you know which judge it's going to be with, you can get into his courtroom and watch how he is, and watch what happens. Now, for instance, I was in front of a judge who was a stamp collector, and I'm a stamp collector. Well, I had this big priority mail envelope with a stamp about this size with the lunar lander on it, and he hadn't seen that before, and he was all a little excited. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and if, if the judge was a golfer, you know, you could relate golf jokes with him or something, you know, to break the ice. But uh, anyhow, there's all kinds of advantages to being in that courtroom and acclimating yourself to it. If you go in and it's a completely foreign environment, it'd be a lot harder for you to function in. But if you've sat through trials, then you, you have a, a gist of how it goes and you can go in there and act as if you know what you're doing. Real quick, um, for, for those who don't know, the part in the Bible is uh, that um, it's described like this. Two men go out to chop wood in the forest, and uh, the one guy takes a swing with the axe, and oops, the axe head comes off, hits his friend in the head, and kills him dead on the spot. Well, the survivor is instructed to flee to the city of refuge and um, to avoid the avenger of blood. Well, who's the avenger of blood? The other guy's family. They don't care that it was an accident. They don't care that these two guys were friends. They don't care about anything. Their family member is dead and they want him dead too. So, uh, the survivor is instructed to flee to the city of refuge, and Moses was instructed to set up three cities of refuge on one side of the Jordan and three on the other side, and as the territory of Israel was expanded, more cities of refuge. The numbers you read about, I think it's like 42 or 44 cities of refuge. Anyway, um, one of the things I said to immigration basically is, there must be three cities of refuge on one side of Mississippi and three on the other. I said, I guess it's uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Dallas. I was in Dallas at the time. I said, well, if I'm mistaken, let me know. I'll move. <laughs> and and uh, I'm still here. I was in Dallas for 25 years. And... Uh, In, in 1990, uh, immigration, well, well, let me say this, in the, in the end of the 80s there, it was, I forget what year it was exactly, it might be around 89, they had that amnesty program for the illegal aliens, and they, they, kept, they kept the immigration office open till, till 12 midnight. And at 10 minutes to 12, I walked in, 
still with a great deal of trepidation about doing anything with government. Um, I'd already had an experience with government in Canada. <laughs> and uh, so I filled out the paperwork and the rest of that, and then things were in process. And the day came when they said, uh, come on in, we need to talk to you. Uh, for your benefit, I, I'll cover that little point here, which is real quick. Ed McCabe, who wrote Oxygen Therapies, got himself a booth at a thing called Whole Life Expo in New York. Now, it's a booth is, you know, a space <laughs> at this expo, and he only had one thing to sell, Oxygen Therapies book. So he asked me if I wanted to share the booth with him. And I said, okay, we'll share the booth. So I go there, and uh, they have a, a desk where exhibitors come in and get their package and, you know, lay out where their booth is and their badge and all that stuff. So uh, this guy presents me uh, eight and a half by 14, like legal size paper, and it's all fine print like the backside of a car rental agreement. And he says, sign here. So I have to sign this. He said, absolutely. If you don't sign it, no booth. Oh, okay. So I pick up the pen and I write two words and they weren't Robert Fox. They were a religious objector. He took the paper and stuck it in his drawer. Okay? Now, turns out at this event, that the, that the they had uh, undercover agents that were wired, they had hidden cameras, and they set up four people for felonies. If you were there and he recommended chicken soup for a cold, you were practicing medicine without a license. Get, you know that kind of thing. They wanted to make me number five, and when they communicated that to me, and I wrote a letter to the attorney general. And I said, you need to check the signature on that contract. <laughs> Finished. <laughs> Not another word. So your signature on their documents, whatever it is, you know, um, you want to be careful about that. And there are a number of ways that you can, how should we say, dissolve your signature before it happens. One is to write without prejudice and then your signature. Uh, another one is at arm's length. Uh, some people use the UCC. Uh, I, I don't because the UCC was created by shysters and uh, they didn't create it for our benefit. And of course, the, one of the ways is, is doing something like I did, just writing religious objector, and that's no little signature at all. And, you know, whether that's a traffic ticket or, or anything else, you know, what do they have if they got religious objector? And then, of course, if they look and they say, what's this? You know, well, I'm a religious objector to this situation. Uh, and they say, no, you have to sign. Okay, well, then they do without prejudice or at arm's length. And that's that. Um, but, again, those things will take your, and dissolve your signature. So that it makes it uh, essentially difficult or impossible for them to prosecute you on the basis of your signature. So that ended that thing there in New York, but what they did is they put me on international television, which went into Canada, and there somebody said, well, we know who that is, and one thing and another, and boom, immigration says, come on in, we need to talk to you. <laughs> and so I went in uh, and, uh, with Cassandra, who was my fiance at the time, and, and uh, 
I saw in their paperwork that they were trying to deport me. And uh, so as soon as I confronted them about that, they clammed up and didn't want to talk about it at all. But I knew what they were up to. So I produced paperwork. And then uh, I was in the thick of the battle. You had something you wanted to say? Oh, OK. Uh, so I was in the thick of the battle. And I, I called George Gordon and I said, Immigration is trying to deport me, and I'm using the city of refuge statutes from the scriptures as my defense. And George says, wow. He said, you're the only guy I've ever known that that actually applied to. And he said, defense strategy is brilliant. He said, I wish I would have thought of it. <laughs> so um, anyway, it worked, and I'm still here. They've tried repeatedly to deport me. And for those who don't know, the Immigration services pretty seriously arbitrary and pretty well focused, you know. So, you know, when they come across somebody, it's just handcuffs and deportation real quick. And uh, <clears throat> um, anyway, uh, I was, I've been through a lot of different things. Uh, City of Garland jailed me six times, for instance, and never brought me to trial. And when I sued them, they moved to have me designated as a vexatious litigant. <laughs> I was supposed to be a vexatious litigant. They're the ones that arrested me six times in a row and never brought me to trial. <laughs> I mean, it was like, what's going to be enough? 60 times, 600 times? You know? Uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, uh, there was a, I moved from Garland to Mesquite, both being suburbs of Dallas, and uh, uh, in Mesquite, uh, they promptly, they got a phone call from Garland, the Garland police told them about me, and so, Boom, 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 they arrested me three times in a row. And, uh, uh, but they quickly discovered that they couldn't get a dime out of me and I would sue them. <laughs> and I had the judge from the municipal court on the witness stand in the Dallas County Court and the detectives waiting up in the hallway and tie the whole works of them up for two whole days and all of that stuff. And they had their fill of it real quick. And so I would pull up to the intersection in Mesquite, and by the way, where I was staying was within walking distance of the police station. So it was like, there's the beehive and the activity all around it. And whether I went to the grocery store or to uh, anywhere else, post office, whatever, I would encounter several cruiser cars, at least one, but a lot of times, many of them. And um, so I pull up in an intersection and then the cop pulls up and he looks and he sees the suburban with no stickers. And uh, then he looks to see who's behind the wheel. And as soon as they saw it was me, the light changes and he's gone. <laughs> and, uh, the, the, apparently the chief of police had put out an intelligence memorandum about me what I was told. I never got to see the thing. But uh, apparently my picture and the description and, and it was like, stay away from this guy. <laughs> so, um, you know, all of that. Anyway, um, in 1990, this word starts coming into a, a big lesson too. In 1990, Richardson Police, which is a suburb of Dallas, uh, stopped me at a traffic stop, and they arrested me. And in the jail, uh, they beat me bloody on the jailhouse floor. And then they discovered that they had nothing to charge me with. I'd been in a, in a brand new Acura, which was basically just off the showroom floor. 
paid for in full in gold. And with the manufacturer's statement of origin made out to me, paid in gold. Now, some people might not understand that. I've seen some blank looks out there. Um, whatever car you got in the parking lot you might think is yours because you've been making payments on it or you've paid it off or you bought it used for cash or whatever the case may be. Uh, it's not yours. All those cars up there have a state flag on the back in the front and uh, they belong to the state. You may, made, you may have made the payments but that's not your car. And you go to the dealership, the way this works is you go to the dealership and you say, I like that Cadillac there. And uh, you come to an agreement on the price, you peel off the cash, they've got a bunch of paperwork to sign here, sign here, sign here. And they send the paperwork off to the state capital and the state capital sends you a certificate of title, which means that title exists somewhere, but one thing we're sure of, you don't have it. You have a certificate of title, not title. Okay? So you, that car is no longer yours, even though you paid for it cash. You know, it's theirs. But the way I had done it, uh, paying for it in full and gold, their own legal counsel told them they couldn't touch that car. They had no charges against me. They were in a panic because it was not only false arrest, but also brutality, etc. So they went fishing for federal agencies and they tried several. You know, a uh, guy came from U.S. Customs, for instance, on the issue of the Kruger hand in my pocket. And the thing was that that was during the time of apartheid with Reagan and all. And the issue was, had I gone to South Africa and brought coins into the, into the country uh, with unauthorized and in violation of, of the embargo, et cetera. And uh, I said, no. I said, all you have to do is look at the date of the coin, and they're available in coin shops from coast to coast. <coughs> that handled that real quick, but it got tough with the State Department. The State Department is the one who really took the bite. And <coughs> so they came, three men in black suits and dark reflective glasses, and they picked me up in chains and irons. They, they bring their own, you know. <laughs> and uh, they took me to the federal building downtown Dallas. And uh, <coughs> I was uh, brought in on, on one charge at the time, forging and counterfeiting entry documents. And then later they added another charge, which was diplomatic impersonation. Now, um, those were two serious federal felonies. And uh, in my initial appearance in the courtroom, blood on my shirt and everything and they were trying to process me well I was at the time basically like a green recruit and um, you know I'd never been in federal court before in my life and been through any of this kind of thing and I was having to learn real quick in the school of hard knocks I did tell the judge the magistrate the magistrate I said uh, this is blood on my shirt from a police beating he said, I thought it was dirt. And I said, would you like me to approach the bench so you can see his blood? He said, no, you just stay where you are. We're here about the criminal matters. We're not here about the civil, the civil rights uh, issues. He didn't care, you know, how badly they beat me or any of that. And uh, anyway, I was denied bond. It didn't matter whether it was a million, a billion, or a trillion. It wasn't enough for somebody as dangerous as me. And uh, so it was immediate incarceration. Um, I was brutalized altogether in that whole deal. I was brutalized seven times. Paramedics were called twice. 
but dragged around through half a dozen different facilities in three different states, tortured and abused for 238 days, 68 days of which were at the infamous federal torture facility in Springfield, Missouri. And among federal prisoners, that place is well known. And, and people are scared of it because <clears throat> you can go there and never come back. Um, they do, that's a huge facility. They've got a medical wing, psychiatric wing, and a prison wing. The prison wing is basically slave labor to take care of the work in the other places. So, um, <laughs> they did what they call a mental evaluation on me. Uh, would you like me to tell you about mental evaluations right now? Because this is a tool that they use against you. At any time, you start affecting them like when they start getting anxious with the stuff that you're filing or your abilities or your knowledge or anything like that, to say, so, you know, the prosecutor or even the judge on his own will just say, uh, there's reason to believe you may be mentally unstable. We're going to send you away for mental evaluation. Well, they've tried that with me, both state and federal, and I've defeated them on both. But in a federal thing, at the time, I didn't know how to do it. And I ended up in, in, in Springfield, but I didn't even have a chance to do it. Because what happened is, the prosecutor did up the motion. And a motion has to have at the end of it a certificate of service, where the prosecutor says, like she did, that it was hand delivered to me that day. I was in jail. It was never delivered to me. Okay? So that's a lie right there. And then she took it to a judge that was not the judge in my case, but a different judge. And had the order made up for him to sign, which he signed. And what it said right in the beginning, that it was unopposed by Mr. Fox's counsel legal counsel. I had no attorney. So the documentation was completely bogus. Both the prosecutor and even the stuff that the judge signed were both bogus. And guess what? They never filed them in my case. They put them in a miscellaneous file so that nobody would know. Certainly I didn't know. But what happened is quarter after three in the morning the guards said, Fox, get your stuff together got a full release. And I thought, wow, my legal paperwork's done its job. I'm going home. And of course, they put me in the holding cell and I'm going to be waiting for the U.S. Marshals to pick me up and I'm sitting in my cell. I guess we have to go into the courtroom and the judge has to bang the gavel and say, case dismissed. Okay, no problem. Well, they picked me up to take me to this facility where I was at was uh, a distance, uh, it took them about, I forget, half an hour or something to, to travel back and forth. But that was only because the U.S. Marshals would do about 100 miles an hour. And uh, uh, in Colorado, they killed a bunch of inmates because they lost control of their men and, and the inmates died, you know, because of it. But they, they, they do that kind of stuff. They just go way over the speed limit. And they don't care because who's going to stop them? And if you're an inmate, if your family's depending on you coming home, you know, you could be just dead meat in the, in the ditch. They don't care. But anyway, um, uh, so they brought me to the court courthouse on the 16th floor in Dallas got these cages where they keep the, uh, the people and they bring them in to court at the appropriate time. So I'm in the cage there waiting and I'm figuring to myself, well, like I say, he has to bang the cap and say case dismissed, everything's good. So uh, then one of the U.S. Marshals said, you aren't going home, you're going to Springfield. I said, what? I said, I need to use the phone immediately. And he's no phone. And so they wrapped me up in chains and irons 
And they took me to Love Field, which is uh, not the big airport, but the small one. And uh, put, they had an, like an executive jet. They had some other prisoners on there. But me, they put in the, in the bathroom, all wrapped in chains and irons, <laughs> over to Springfield. Nobody, my family, friends, nobody could figure out how I disappeared from Texas. It was gone, disappeared. Because the paperwork was in a miscellaneous file. Finally, a friend of mine went to the prosecutor and confronted them about the situation and got the information that I was in Springfield. Um, interestingly, they had me in solitary confinement at Springfield, and uh, the way I got messages out, uh, there was one guy, only one guy, who had the balls to talk to me through the crack in the door. Ten minutes. Uh, and he was the illegitimate son of Lucky Luciano. And when I did get out of solitary confinement, he took me to a special area, and I was introduced to the godfather, Fat Tony Salerno, in the wheelchair, the one who had called the hit on Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> anyway, these are interesting people, and they only got about a thousand times more integrity than the federal government. <laughs> and so anyway, uh, and actually we've remained friends, and they, at times, it was, they called me to Vegas and set me up in a high-rise penthouse deal in a gated community in Vegas. Uh, and this was a gigantic penthouse, the whole top area of the 30-story high-rise. And in the lower stories was Janet Jackson, uh, uh, Ronnie uh, Dangerfield, and others. <laughs> But the penthouse, which was in magazines as being the most you know, outrageous and extravagant place, uh, that's where they put me. <laughs> and, and the place, you had to see it to believe it. Uh, it, it, was, it was like it was designed by Bob Guccione and Hugh Hefner. There was, swimming, there was two indoor swimming pools in there. And, and one of them, it was like you exit from the swimming pool to a bed for eight. <laughs> They're just direct. <laughs> anyway, that's all off to the side. But um, the, the mental issue, they will try and get you in court on a mental issue if you are raising a ruckus with them. And the way you handle that is best to have it. There's several ways. There's like there always several ways to skin a cat, okay? So the first and best one is get your own mental evaluation ahead of time by somebody who is in your favor, okay? So when you get called in on that, when you get called in on that, you just uh, whip it out for your pocket and say, excuse me, I already have my mental evaluation by board certified, so-and-so. However, judge, I don't think that you or the prosecutor have had your mental evaluation. <laughs> so under equality under the law, we need to adjourn these proceedings until you gentlemen get your mental evaluations to be sure that I'm not in jeopardy for your craziness. <laughs> now they're not going to get their mental evaluations, but it would be the end of that conversation. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, if you get in a surprise attack like I was in, um, and they're going to, you know, send you away anyway. Well, first off, you're entitled to a hearing. And in the state, they brought me into court. Uh, they had taken away my cane and, and they had me in a wheelchair and they brought me into the courtroom. And I'm facing what I considered the wrong way. I'm facing the jury area. And they had appointed a couple of public defenders. and. So I turned to them and I said, are you planning on doing uh, some sort of hearing like this? And uh, they said, yes, this is a mental evaluation hearing. And that they were going to select the jury for this. And I said, wait a second. 
I didn't give it any notice. I moved around in the chair, and the judges at the elevated level up there, and I said, I haven't been given any due process, notice, and opportunity. See, the cornerstone to due process is the notice and opportunity. You have to have both notice and opportunity. Otherwise, they're screwed. So <clears throat> I said, I'm entitled to notice and, and, and opportunity. I said, I have my own witnesses to call, but this total surprise has deprived me of my witnesses and I'm not prepared to go forward. So he's looking in his book and sure enough, I'm right. And he said, okay, we're gonna set this off. Well, I had people come in and uh, I had a whole bunch of witnesses, as a matter of fact. They got scared. They set the thing off again. <laughs> and when people came again for me, they figured, well, this isn't gonna work, just shuffling it along. So they said, okay, we're having the hearing. The prosecutor came to me and said, Mr. Fox, I'm not even going to cross-examine your witnesses, okay? They had Dr. Grigson. Dr. Grigson was known in the media as Dr. Death, who laid away some 4,000 people. Well, I had four doctors and three other people to testify for me, and that was it. My friend, Dr. Tedford, <coughs> had the jury literally laughing out loud against Grigson. It was the most resounding defeat probably in his entire career. So we're out of time for this segment. We'll be back with, with uh, fun and excitement very shortly. So, um, with regards to the question, I think that uh, Susie, Susie said that you know you could come up to the microphone and and ask your question. Um, we. Uh, I want to keep it to, you know, like the current topic because we'll, we'll be covering a lot of stuff this weekend and, uh, um, you know, I may be covering a, what, what you might be about to ask. I may be covering later this afternoon or tomorrow or something. And uh, if, it's, if it's not, uh, you know, the current topic, let's say, We've been talking about uh, the mental evaluation. We've talked about agency. If somebody had an issue about DWI, we're going to get to that. Um, you had a question now? I do. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Mark, and the question I have is with regard you went to Texas Rule 12. Right. You're talking about agency. Right. And if I understand it correctly, you use you utilize that in Texas. Now, does that can that apply across straight lines, uh, yes. state lines? Yes, and it does on the principle that I mentioned before, um, and that is uh, equal footing doctrine or full faith and credit, which is in the Constitution, and the the encyclopedias of law, and jur and corpus juris. They cite cases from all kinds of states, okay? So you can use those decisions coming into your situation. Now, Texas is, is blessed with that one rule that makes it quick and easy. For some of these other places, they don't want to understand it. And you catch the difference here? They don't want to understand the issue. And so sometimes you basically have to hammer it into their head. And one of the things that will do that is federal crop insurance versus Maryland. And when we come back this afternoon, I'll give you the, the site and the information on that, okay? Because you've raised an important issue. And federal crop insurance versus Maryland covers that, and it's federal, okay? So, and in the federal system, what I'm telling you, they want to avoid this agency issue at all costs. <laughs> but there's ways of pounding it into their head. And uh, 
There was a, uh, a gal here, and she's outside. Uh, Carla, Terry, you get Carla. You're in trouble now. Yeah, you're in trouble now. So you come and tell us at the microphone here what you were studying and what what you think about it. You said it's huge. Okay. Um, I've been studying the American. Agency. Agency. The, um, not the course, uh, American Jurisprudence. There's two editions. There's the first one, which is the 1936 edition. That is amazing. Um, I just started reading it with page one. Um, I have not been able to find it online anywhere, even as a law library. You may have to go in and just sit the library and photocopy it or read it there. I don't know. It does differ quite a bit from the second one, but it's, it's awesome. And, and the um, oh, the first one. Um, the first one is less than 500 pages. It's 400 and something. The second one is 700 and somewhat pages. But I recommend that you go back and study the first, and then look at the case law, see if it's been overturned. I'm in the process of doing that. But where were you this book, Carl? Law Library. The downtown Phoenix. Or yeah, you can buy it. Probably it would cost you a bunch of money. Because uh, whether it's amateur or corpus juris, you're talking uh, 60 something law books, you know, this thick. I mean, it, it'd be, you know, the, more than the full length of this table of these books standing on the end. What prompted and Isn't that so? Yeah. What, um, what prompted me to study it is I'm trying to, I don't want to use the word represent because I know it has legal meaning, but I'm trying to get like a power of attorney for a couple people to be able to go to court in their behalf as a power of attorney, and I know the courts are going to shoot that down. And so I started studying attorney in fact, and they're still going to shoot that down, but that referred me to agency. And that's where my study for agency has come through. Attorneys at law are an agent. They are one type of an agent. They're a special, they're a specialty agent. And it's, um, it's a good read. I'm not very far into it yet, but uh, I again recommend read the first one, the 1936 edition. State the title again. It's American Jurisprudence, the Legal Encyclopedia. And your comment was that the thing is huge. It's really huge. And on, it seems like it was page 19, and I can't remember the wording, but it basically says that you can be an agent for anybody for anything. There's case law now under attorney in fact that says that you can, you know, do whatever for someone as long as it's outside of court. And I just wasn't an okay with that. I was not in agreement with that. And I knew that there had to be more. And so that's why I'm studying the whole agency thing. Well, okay, thank you, Carla. Um, it's interesting what Carla had mentioned there. Uh, and I will just fill in something here. Carla, I hope you're going to stay for this. Yeah. Uh, the the thing is that uh, I have sat at the defense table in criminal cases in federal court in five different states Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, Wisconsin, and Florida. And it didn't come, you know, easy. I mean, it was a struggle uh, in, uh, in Florida. You know, on the whole page, you know, in gigantic letters in color, Judge Jordan is a liar, <laughs> you know, filed in one of the documents. And because he was denying me the ability to get into the courtroom and sit at the defense table. And <laughs> after I called him a liar, I was sitting in the, in the courtroom at the defense table. <laughs> you know, so. And in, in Oklahoma, it was it was another funny one because uh, the defendant is at the defense table, and he expresses to the judge that he wants Robert Fox to be sitting with him as assistants of counsel, and that's that's right from the Constitution that wording, assistance of counsel. It doesn't say in the Constitution representation by attorney. Okay, it says assistance to counsel, and this is what he asked for. 
So I stood up in the audience area and proceeded to the communion rail. And I'm opening the gate. And the judge says, one moment, Mr. Fox. Do you have a license to practice law in the state of Oklahoma? And my response was, neither the attorneys present here today nor yourself, sir, have a license to practice law in the state of Oklahoma. He turns to the prosecution and he says, does the prosecution have any objection to Mr. Fox sitting at the defense table? <laughs> and they said, oh yes, we object, blah, blah, this, and blah, blah, that. And then the judge listens to their thing and he turns back to me and says, very well, Mr. Fox, you may sit at the defense table. Now, you all understand what he did? He deflected the issue. He had the room, the courtroom was loaded. And in, if he would have said, let me, let me backtrack for a second. He could tell from the way I was, and this goes back to what I said earlier, act as if, okay? He could tell by the way I presented that issue that it would be a, an incredible blunder for him to say, well, Mr. Fox, what do you mean by that? And then it opened the floodgates and and everybody in the courtroom would hear out they don't have any license. Okay? So he didn't he didn't let that happen. He turns to the prosecution and everybody pays attention to what the prosecution's objection is. And when they're finishing objecting, he says, very well, Mr. Fox, you can sit in the defense table. And so I've I've uh, sat at the defense table in five different states, and I, I don't know anybody else who's done that, but uh, there could be somebody out there, and uh, um, but I just haven't met him yet. And uh, uh, with regards to uh, the uh, the agency issue and the attorney issue, uh, what they uh, is you know what Carla's saying is correct. And to help you with your situation, Carla, one of the things that I do is I have a document, entry into the case. And attorneys are supposed to file an entry into the case when, the, when they get hired or whatever to do that and they inform the court that they're entering the case. Well, I have my own document for that. And so I can get a power of attorney from the defendant and file my entry into the case and declare that I'm assistance of counsel and that I'm not there representing them. And uh, I have done this kind of thing in, on uh, many occasions. And uh, one that comes to mind that particularly interesting is there's a fellow, his name is John McGladdery, a really nice guy, and they hit him with nine state felonies and five state misdemeanors, and he was out on federal uh, parole, and, uh, or you know, parole, and he had a, a probation, he had a previous federal felony conviction anyway, and, uh, but he was he hadn't really done anything wrong, and uh, because it's easy to get convicted of, of doing anything. I mean, when the cop points the finger at you and says, you're silly in a no silly zone, or you're ugly in a no, no ugly zone, or stinky in a no stinky zone, you, you got it. You know, I mean, they'll, they'll convict you of anything. You know? And, uh, um, so, anyway, McGladdery was, I think, seven foot three. And so the judge is elevated and typically is looking down on everyone else. But with the glittery stands so tall, he's looking up at him. Good. <laughs> and, yeah, good. And, and uh, um, the uh, uh, prosecution would do something. And I had a pad and I put an O there. And John would immediately, objection, 
And then I would whisper the objection in his ear, and he said, well, I object because of this, this, or this. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and so we conducted ourselves that way, and, the, and you know, the, the system was not liking it, but uh, uh, we won anyway. All these nine state felonies and five state misdemeanors, the prosecutor met with us in the hallway. This was in Chicago. And the prosecutor met with us in the hallway and told John McGlattery, point blank, that he was going bye-bye forever. They were going to throw away the key, you know, because with a, with a previous federal felony conviction and being on, on uh, parole and uh, this and that, uh, you know, they, as far as they were concerned, it was the three strikes thing, and they were going to finish him off. But, you know, uh, I worked with him on the thing. They were suing him not only criminally in the state, but also civilly. Plus, during the episode, he went through a divorce with his wife, a bitter divorce. And she wanted money, and it turned it around where he was, you know, challenging that to a reversal because she had the job, paying job and was making good money, and he had no job at all. So it was like, she should pay him. <laughs> anyway, uh, the divorce thing was handled. The civil case uh, was, we will we'll probably cover that one in a, in a later session, but uh, we prevailed in the civil case and the criminal case, the whole thing. So, um, That whole issue of agency, uh, Carla agrees, is, is just huge. And there's things that you can do. Uh, you can do to help your friends in, in, in criminal cases. And uh, Mr. Eichmann knows about it, the amicus curiae. Yeah. I heard you the other day. I've turned the switch on a couple weeks ago. Turn it on. Turn it on. Put the, put the button. Top. Towards you. Yeah, I, 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 had, I got the information about two weeks ago that they must have a warrant of authority from an authority higher than them. You can challenge a judge, an attorney, and the clerk of the court. None of them ever have a warrant of authority. And I haven't had a chance to check that out completely yet, but person that told me that's now out of the country and he'll be back in a month or so. So I think he has the, uh, the references. I didn't get it at the time. I just was so thrilled with what I heard that it got excited. Well, it makes sense. Turn off the mic, microphone off. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, I want to wrap up that issue of the mental evaluation thing because they snagged so many people on that uh, and it blindsides them and they don't know what to do, okay? Uh, and it, it could happen to anybody at any time in any court case. and. So if they ever snag you with that stuff, and and they get past the the uh, due process notice and opportunity, where you're entitled to a hearing on this matter, where you can present your evidence and your witnesses to counter their accusation that you may be mentally unstable. Okay, and I did that successfully, like I say, against Dr. Grigson was known as Dr. Death. Well, if they get past that and you are sent away to a mental facility, and like in the federal system, they had me whisked away and I didn't know it was coming, okay? If you end up there and you end up face to face with a psychiatrist or psychologist in one of their deals that, uh, and they, they want to do a mental evaluation. And they could ask you, you know, do you know what year it is? Do you know who the president is? 
to determine whether you've got any functioning brain cells? Well, the answer to the thing right from the get is I cannot be compelled to be a witness against myself. I'm standing on the Fifth Amendment and I have nothing more to say to you. And you don't give them the time of day and you don't agree to that whether there's gravity or not. You don't agree to anything like as I told you, I have nothing to say to you. I'm going back to my cell. And uh, <laughs> there was a federal inmate that called me in an emergency situation and he, he was being whisked away to a, a facility on the East Coast. This is a guy from Louisiana. And uh, he did this process that I just related to you. And he told the, uh, the doctors and nurses there that he was going to be leaving shortly. And they said, no, no, you're here for a 90-day evaluation. And he said, Regardless, he said, I'm going to be leaving shortly. <laughs> and in a jiffy, he was gone. It did, there, it's a slow process in the federal system with the U.S. Marshals, but it ended the mental evaluation thing immediately. And a few weeks later, he was out of there. And uh, uh, he didn't have to put up with their nonsense. And what happens, this is such a dangerous thing, by the way, because if you'll recall the movie with Jack Nicholson, What Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he pretended he was crazy so that he didn't have to do work uh, with a hoe or whatever as like prison slaves, and he was gonna take it easy at the mental hospital. And everything was going great, and near the end of his time, he said to that black orderly that my, my prison time is up here shortly. And then the black orderly said, you're not in prison, you're in a mental hospital, and you aren't going anywhere until Nurse Ratchet says so. <laughs> and when he realized that, it was like, uh oh, <laughs> it's clearer in the book than it is in the movie. But uh, that's a very serious thing if you slip into that deal where they can label you as being mentally unstable and then they'll say, well, we've got medications to help you. Okay, and that's what they tried with, with me. The psychiatrist, I said, damn well, uh, see, I didn't know this this thing that I just gave you. I was a green recruit at the time. And so they had, had run some of their, their their tests on me. And I, I met up with this, the, uh, I'll just tell you, they treat you like kindergarten there. I was kept in solitary confinement for an extended period of time. And then only allowed out a little bit and you know, tell, I could be out from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon and go from my cell to the day room where I could watch television. But I had to be back in at four, curfew, you know. <laughs> four in the afternoon. <laughs> and then I could stay out later and then they would let me afterwards go to the cafeteria and stuff like that. I got a comment on that. When you're in a war, you have a guardian. What you need to do is to put in a, a denial of guardianship. A denial of guardianship kills one. Okay. Thank you. Which it relates back to the agency issue, and I think Carla would agree to that. Yeah. And and uh, um, what was the other thing? Anyway, uh, so I met with this psychi psychologist in the hallway after they would, were letting me out to go to the cafeteria and stuff like that. And uh, I said, well, how am I doing? And 
he said, well, we have serious reservations about, you know, your reality contact and your mental stability. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, in all likelihood, you'll be back for treatment. And he said, what does that mean? And he said, well, we have medications for your kind. <laughs> and the thing is, I'd already seen that because they had guys that they had strapped onto the bunk wearing a diaper because they ain't going to the bathroom. They're strapped to their bunk. They load them up with Thorazine, which is a chemical lobotomy. It's a chainsaw to the brain. And then when they were finished with these guys, they would be in the hallway and they were walking around and it was like the night of the living dead. Their eyes were open, but you never saw such a vacant look. It was like the intelligence of, of a potato walking around on two legs. I mean, it's bad news. So what I'm sharing with you, you know, I hope you never even get challenged with such a thing, but if you do, you are now equipped to to put the kibosh on that deal. Okay. One of the most uh, important things that I can share with you is that in terms of powerful tools, this thing is an understanding of how this stuff goes. The only thing that counts, just basically from my experience, you won't find this in a book in Walmart, okay? The only thing that counts in that courtroom environment is facts put into evidence by testimony, okay? Now, if you watch court proceedings, the attorney speaks, the judge says, well, what do you have to say? You talk, and and I've seen this time and again with people, and they talk to the judge, and the judge starts smiling, and, and they tell me that everything's going well, okay? Well, the judge isn't smiling for that reason, and, and what is happening is they got one over on you right there. Okay, the only thing that counts is testimony. Facts put into evidence by testimony. So if it isn't testimony, it's just noise. It fits in the category of burps, farts, coughs, air conditioner noise, and it's just noise, regardless of what you're saying. And at the end of it all, after you've spilled it all out for an hour, an hour and a half, the judge gets to what? Make the decision as to whether he likes the noise from the attorney or likes the noise from you. And guess how that works out? <laughs> and an attorney cannot testify. Exactly. Kinsey versus Pagliaro and a whole other bunch. It's Gonzalez versus Butes. His attorney cannot testify, no matter what he says. That's the problem I have right here. The judges for seven years have allowed attorneys to testify. They, they, he, you have to have a live body to commence a case and a live body to end it. So, so uh, that's exactly correct. It is Trinzi versus Pagliaro. There's another case, and I'm going to give you the sites for these things, by the way, uh, and I'll provide them to you in writing. Um, there's another case called Government of the Virgin Islands versus Shuru. And what that case says is that the court, meaning in their vernacular, the judge, cannot assume facts not in evidence, even if he believes the facts to be true. If it isn't established on the record by testimony and evidence, then it doesn't count for anything. And I'm going to give you an example of this. It actually embodies several things. So, uh, 
know, it occurs to me, I, I didn't cover the issue of um, what happened after I left Dallas, where I was for 25 years. Went to Jacksonville at the invitation of a, a wonderful gentleman, Dr. Barry Pikes, who's a dentist, and he had a large building there. It had four postal designations. There was frontage on Main Street and on the other main drag called Rusk. There were two postal designations on Main Street and two on Rusk. And his dental clinic was up on Main Street and he made available to me an office that was on, on Rusk in the far end of the building from him. The day came when he came running into my office and said, Robert, U.S. Marshals are here and they're taking me away. Well, I knew where they were taking him, to the Tyler Federal Court. So I picked up the phone, called the lady there in Tyler, said, please, get into the courtroom where Dr. Brooks is and give me a report. So after a while, I, the woman calls and she says, uh, U.S. Attorney Alan Jackson stood up and and said, uh, Dr. Brooks left to his own devices, will practice dentistry without a license. He needs to be incarcerated immediately. This is very interesting since it's a federal tax case. <laughs> you know, what's that got to do with dentistry? Well, anyway, um, that's what he said, and, uh, or that's what the report is, anyway. So then Dr. Brooks, who, walks a closer walk with our Savior than anybody else I know. He is kind and generous. When I was in the county jail in the rec area, people would come up to me and, and they told me point blank that they knew I was innocent. They knew Dr. Brooks and that Dr. Brooks had taken care of their dental needs for free. Um, he did discount dentistry for everyone, and for the poor, he did it for free, and he even sought out opportunities to do it for free. He's that kind of guy. So, but he is meek, mild, polite, non-confrontational. He doesn't like adversity. So he doesn't say anything. Well, I, you know, in my estimation, big mistake, but, he doesn't say anything, so then the judge says, well, Dr. Brooks gets to put you in the Smith County Jail. And he said, well, I don't want to go to jail, because you know how he's getting it, you know. <laughs> well, I don't want to go to jail. And the judge says, well, Dr. Brooks, people in your position, they don't want to go to jail, but that's just the way it is. You're going to jail. Click, click with the handcuffs, and the U.S. Marshals take him away. So I said to the lady who was reporting this to me, she said, I said, uh, did anyone testify? She says, what do you mean? I said, did anyone come in, raise their right hand, get sworn into, into the thing, and go to the witness stand and testify? And she says, no, nobody did that. I said, uh-huh. So I wrote up an amicus curiae affidavit. Amicus curiae simply means friend of the court. Okay? How do you spell that? A M I C U R A I E. I A E. Yeah. We'll give it to you. I'll, I'll, I'll provide it. So, amicus curiae, and so in this amicus curiae, I I pointed out that the uh, the judge had been assuming facts, not in evidence, contrary to government of Virgin Islands versus Sheru. Now, that particular case is not only a published case in the law books, but it's also in the federal uh, evidence books. It's, a, it's an outstanding case because the judge was informed by the bailiff of certain things 
and the judge had had this bailiff for like 15 years and they had a trust relationship just like you have with a good friend and so the judge had been informed of certain things and proceeded on that basis but they weren't in the courtroom there was nothing on the court record and there were no facts in evidence put there by testimony and that's why they made a big issue in that case and uh, so this is exactly what was happening in Tyler, Texas in the federal courtroom with Dr. Brooks assuming facts not in evidence and then I said well and the bad part about it is that Dr. Brooks was deprived of his liberty and the way that they were doing it was in the nature of man stealing Exodus 21 16 for which the Bible says the punishment is death <laughs> and then I went on to make an offer of proof and an offer of proof is a very powerful tool as well and I made an offer of proof that that Alan Jackson the, uh, the US attorney there was a uh, mental incompetent the criminal and criminal enterprise and a satanic minion practicing idolatry and child sacrifice <laughs> so i was speaking to a group in california and the guy puts up his hand and he says, well mr fox are you telling us it's okay to lie in an affidavit i said oh you think it's a lie <laughs> <laughs> I said, give it to me for a few minutes on the witness stand. I can prove up all of it. <laughs> so, I mean, he pays his taxes, doesn't he? And, and allegedly in their system, they have this belief that the tax is going to pay for federal agents and so on. And... There were 17 little children in Waco that died with no due process, not a day in court, and they were incinerated, etc. So they were they were like passed through. Their seed was passed through the fire to Mola in in a you know a ritualistic burning. And uh, he paid for it. Now you know what happens to you. If you pay to have somebody murdered, the same penalty falls on you. It's called the law of the parties. You know, when the guys go to rob the bank and you drive the getaway car, the fact that they killed two security guards and kidnapped the bank president, those charges of murder and kidnapping fall on the driver of the getaway car too. <laughs> you understand this concept? So, <clears throat> 